Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture on CT and MRI. So first I want to give a shout out to Fred Epstein, the chair of BME, uh, for making these slides. Um, and let's begin. So let's talk about the outline. So let's first, uh, we're going to break this down and talk about the origin of the magnetic resonance imaging signal. We are then going to talk about the properties of the MRI magnetization and image contrast, spatially encoding the signal, case space, pulse sequences, and hardware. So this will be the MRI portion of this talk. And then we'll talk about the CT or computed tomography. So the origin of the MRI signal, and let's back up just a little bit. So why do you have to know anything about the physics of these imaging modalities? Well, in order to design an agent or a nanoparticle or something to allow imaging, you have to understand how the contrast or how the signal is made in order to design the appropriate contrast agent. So I'm going to give you just the rudimentary, um, very fundamental basics of this. And then if you're interested in um, more, going more in detail, I can point you to some sources. But the origin of the MRI signal. The MRI signal comes from a magnetic property of protons called spin. Um, in MRI, for the most part, almost always, you're detecting the spin from hydrogen atoms. Now there are other nuclei that have uneven number of electrons, so they're unpaired uh, protons, excuse me, protons, unpaired protons, that results in spin and that you can detect but for the most part, most MRI are protons, hydrogen protons. So when there is no external magnetic field, so this is just us sitting around here, these protons are spinning in random directions. There's, there's absolutely no magnetic moment. However, when you apply an external magnetic field, and this is denoted by B0, this is the magnetic field, they align in a low energy state or against a high energy state of the external B0 field. So now all of these are aligned. And because they are all aligned, now you can start to detect these magnetic moments. So again, all of these are spins and they're mag magnetic moments. The transitions can be induced between the two states using radio frequency energy. So by applying radio frequency, you can change the, the states of these. So some of these, a large proportion of these protons are going to align with the magnetic field. However, there will be some that will align against the magnetic field. And then... And what's happening is as these things process, precess, so rotating around their axis, they actually produce a signal that can be heard. So let's see how this works. More spins are going to align with the external field. So you're going to get a, a net magnetization vector. In this 3D diagram, that's exactly what this looks like. So going back to this. Again, this is your net magnetization vector. It's pointing in the Z direction just by convention. And that's because, again, more of the spins are going to align with that external field. So what happens when we, when we apply a radio frequency or RF energy? So application of the RF energy at resonant frequency, so that's the frequency that these protons are precessing, they're moving around, tips the magnetization vector into the tra traverse plane. So applying the RF pulse is going to tip this into the traverse plane, which is the x-axis. And this x is denoted, this is the RF coil. So application of the RF energy at the resonance frequency tips the magnetization vector into the traverse plane. So what you saw before was the stationary frame. And stationary frame is synonymous with a carousel looking at it 
um, as it's rotating around. So you see the horses going up and down, but you also see them um, going around in a circle. To simplify all of this, people who do MR like to look at this in the rotating frame. So this is as though you are on the horse on the carousel. So all you see is the up and down. So it removes that, that uh, precessing motion. So in the rotating frame view, what you see is that that vector has tipped down into the traverse or transverse plane. So again, you're not seeing that rotating part, which was the previous movie. You're just seeing it tip into the transverse plane. How do we find the, the MRI signal? The transverse magnetization precesses at what's called the Larmor frequency. So that's the frequency, and it's determined by the um, radio frequency um, at the different magnetic strips. So at a 1.5 Tesla magnet, it's 63 megahertz. At a 3 Tesla magnet, it would be different, 7 Tesla, 9 Tesla, so on and so forth. But the Larmor frequency is the frequency that it precesses, the, adult, or the protons precess. So the precessing transverse magnetization induces a voltage in the RF receiver coil, and this makes a Fourier transform. So as it's listening in, this receiver is listening in, it is making a Fourier transform. So let's talk now, so now we know the origin of the MR signal, that is the um, aligning of the protons along the magnetic moment and then adding energy to it in an RF pulse to move some of those from the low energy state to the higher energy misaligned state. So let's now talk about the properties of the MRI magnetization and image appearance. So the first part is T1 relaxation. So the MZ, this is the magnetic vector, recovers exponentially with a time constant T1. So when it's tipped down into that transverse plane, after you remove the RF frequency, so after you remove the energy, it is going to recover, that net magnetization vector is going to recover at a time constant, and that time constant is T1. T1 depends on the physical and chemical magnetic environment, and T1 is different for different tissues. So for example, it's 850 milliseconds for myocardium and 1,000 milliseconds for blood. So it takes longer for the magnetization, the NZ, um, to recover in blood than it takes for it to recover in the heart, for example. Images can be T1 weighted, so depending on the pulse sequence, short T1 appears bright, long T1 appears dark. Um, and so these are your recovery, uh, depending on how you weight uh, the different things. So again, the short T1 is bright here, dark T1 is, or long T1 is dark. Something I want you to know, and this is of high importance for what we're doing here in uh, our class, is that gadolinium is a T1 shortening contrast agent. So gadolinium is chelated by this molecule DTPA. It's a heterocyclic uh, chelator. DTPA can be coupled or conjugated to nanoparticles where it can then chelate gadolinium and this makes it a T1 contrast agent. So gadolinium is a T1 shortening contrast agent. When gadolinium is administered and accumulates in a tissue, it will make the tissue appear bright on a T1 weighted MR image. There's a second property of magnetization that we want to look at and that's T2 relaxation. So MXY decays exponentially with a time constant T2. So this is not going back up along the y-axis, or along, back up along the z-axis, but it is relaxing very quickly along the, um, along the, M, the xy plane. So instead of all being focused on this one plane, this X plane, it is now dephasing or unfocused outside of there. 
So this is called T2. So the decay is T2, and the dephasing is T2 star. So T2 and T2 star depend on the local static magnetic environment. So this is different than T1. And T2 star really depends on inhomogeneities in the magnetic field. No matter how perfect we make the magnet, there's nothing we can do. And so this is the decay of the signal um, over time in the MXY plane. And as these are decaying, these are all vectors. So instead of all being along this one, this one plane or this one line, they are dephasing. And so that means the sum of all these vectors means that you have an absence of signal. So it starts off when it's all along this plane at a very high signal, and then as it de decays or dephases, you can see that the signal decreases because these vectors are now out of phase um, and not showing up in the signal. So images can be just like T1, they can be T2 weighted. Long T2 appears bright, short T2 appears dark. So this is different than the T1. T2 of myocardium is 60 milliseconds, so this is going to be dark. And T2 of blood is 200 milliseconds. And so here, if you look at this pericardial cyst, uh, this must be along T2, or fluid must be along T2 because it's bright. So let's talk a little bit about types of magnetism um, because these are some of the other contrast agents that we can use. And the superparamagnetic nanoparticles can be used to change T2 star weighted sequences. So anything that accumulates a superparamagnetic uh, particle will become dark on a T2 star weighted image. So paramagnetism is positive induced field parallel to applied field it has a stronger effect that is mediated through unpaired electrons. It shortens T2 and shortens T1 if accessible by water protons. And gadolinium DTPA is a paramagnetic contrast agent. Gadolinium is most often associated with T1 contrast. Superparamagnetic, on the other hand, is magnetic dipoles of unpaired electrons of adjacent atoms interact with each other in crystalline structures. These form magnetically stable domains, and it's called superparamagnet, superparamagnetism. And adjacent domains interact with each other, producing ferromagnetism. This has very strong effects, and so the sensitivity, the amount you can detect of a superparamagnetic or a ferromagnetic nanoparticle is much higher than a gadolinium nanoparticle. So if you need to image something at really low concentrations, an iron oxide crystal is much better than a gadolinium um, conjugated nanoparticle. However, because it's dark, the dynamic range is very limited, and so you have to do a pre and post scan to figure out how dark it was before you injected it. And for that reason, most people don't like the absence of signal. They like the gain of signal that's in the gadolinium. So now we've got the origins of the signal and the property of the signal, so let's figure out how we're spatially encoding the signal. So this is slice selection, and this is a term called voxel. These are volume pixels, and so these are 3D pixels, not just 2D pixels. So a voxel is dependent the size of the voxel is dependent on the imaging modality that you're using. Um, and so you need to have enough signal in a voxel in order to be able to observe it or see it in the imaging. However, if you make it too big, then the resolution or the distance, so resolution is a really important term, resolution is the distance um, between two structures that you can see. So when, when the two structures are two structures and not just one, so resolving it from each other, um, that's dependent on the voxel size. So if you have large voxels because your signal is really low, then that means your resolution is really terrible because you, you can't see beyond, you can't see inside of a voxel.
Um, it's like the difference between the old school um, Mario Brothers pixelated, oh, and even Minecraft pixelated versus the really nice resolution and graphics of some of your PlayStation games that uh, are out there now. The magnetic field gradient will equate position and frequency. So you can apply a magnetic field gradient and how the, the different voxels see that magnetic field gradient can encode position and then frequency. And then the RF pulse can excite um, the frequency band. So this, call, this is a position band. So it allows us to spatially encode the MR signal, which gives you a 3D um, reconstruction. And the other term that I really want you guys to know is tomographic. So tomographic is 2D slices that can be, um, that can be put together to create a 3D image. Um, this is the difference between X-ray and CT. So magnetic field gradients, again, are used to equate physical position with the frequency of the transverse magnetization. So here's your sample, and it is in, um, it's exposed to a different field gradient. What that means is each of these protons are going to start spinning at different frequencies. And depending on what frequency or what field gradient, part of the field gradient they saw, that will encode for the position of where these protons are. So they can equate the physical position with the phase of the transverse magnetization. So again, that's a really important concept, that these field gradients are used to equate the physical position with the phase of the transverse magnetization. This allows this to be tomographic and allows it to be 3D. So we've got all of the data, we've spatially encoded the signal, what does the image actually look like? So there has to be a lot of imaging reconstruction and imaging processing. It's not, a, it, it's not like microscopy where you can look through and with your naked eye you can see the image and that's fine because your eye can see that. That's not how MRI works. We cannot uh, figure out voltage and then transform that into something. And so there's a lot of work done with um, transforming this into an image that we can recognize. And so with the reception of the magnetics of the MR signal, the precessing transverse magnetization from the entire sample induces a voltage in the RF coil. And that is this equation down here, and this is a Fourier transform. So image reconstruction using the Fourier transform, so it starts out in case space, cycles per um, minute, cycles per minute, and then using the set of the 2D Fourier transforms, you can get position by image space. So it transforms this into something that you can recognize. In this case, this is the heart, the apex of the heart. So here's case space and then image space. So this is what case space looks like. This is what, after the reconstruction algorithm, the image looks like, so on and so forth. So again, lots of Fourier transform. So let's talk about factors affecting signal to noise ratio. These are very, very important, especially for imaging. Um, signal to noise ratio is the mean signal intensity divided by the standard deviation of the background. So in this case, the signal to noise ratio is much better than in this case. You can see the noise um, around it. So the B0 field is dependent on B0 uh, well signal to noise ratio depends on the B0 field strength. So signal amplitude is proportional to B0 squared. Noise is proportional to B0, so signal-to-noise ratio is proportional to B0. So in general, the higher strength of the magnetic field, the less noise that you have. And that makes a little bit of sense because um, the higher the signal you have, um, the better it is above background, and so it makes the ratio so much better. So again, that's the squared relationship to the linear relationship here. So noise sources are Brownian motion of electrons. Um, 
electrons just move throughout the body, they create currents. Um, and there's also Brownian motion of electrons in the receiver coil. So they generate random electrical fluctuations, which of course can introduce noise. This is called Johnson noise or resistance noise. So how noise adds, noise is not correlated, it adds as a square root. So the amount of MXY, so these are the, the, um, the amount of signal in this plane, and then the voxel size, so how many protons are contributing. This voxel is incredibly important for all imaging uh, technologies. So you need to know how much signal is contributing. That's your voxel size. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about hardware. So this is what an MR scanner looks like. It's um, the patient lays here. Uh, and then this bed moves, and it moves uh, in this plane into this open bore, and inside here is the magnet, and this is where the uh, magnetic field frequency is going to be. Um, there are open magnets for people that are claustrophobic, um, but the majority of the imaging will take place in a closed uh, MR. So using the contrast agent, so this is gadolinium DTPA. This is well done. Um, this is used on almost every MRI. So this is a T1 weighted spin echo pulse. So you can see that there's some lesions here in the brain. But when you add the gadolinium DTPA on the T1 weighted pulse, you can see that there's uh, lesions throughout this brain. Um, and these are actually an amoeba. Um, Pretty disgusting um, that this patient picked up uh, in a in a lake, a still lake. But you can see the brain eating amoeba in here. But that can be seen by the gadolinium DTPA. Um, gadolinium and liposomes. These have been done quite a bit, so you guys know by now what the liposome looks like. You can add the DTPA to the lipid and then chelate gadolinium here, incubate it with the cells, and then the cells, will, um, the cells will take up the liposome. Um, and then you can do some imaging with it. This is done uh, quite a bit, especially with targeted liposomes, so we can keep track by MRI where things are going. Um, and then you can also use advanced vascular detection with polymeric gadolinium. So these are two products. Magnavist is on the market. Um, it's trademarked. And so these are just um, examples of comparing and contrasting this new formulation, polymeric CA. So it's just polymers with a lot of gadolinium on them. And they're so big that they stay in the normal healthy vessels. And so you can see the delineation of the healthy vessels. And then what, these, what this group is claiming is that because there's a larger number of gadolinium, their agent is better, and so you can see better delineation of all of the blood vessels. Um, these are T2 star weighted particles, and so these are first generation uh, super paramagnetic iron oxides. Faradex, Resovis, these two are coated with dextran. So these are iron oxide, 5 nanometer iron oxide crystals coated with dextran or carboxydextran. This formulation is Resovis. This is Faradex. Um, these are monodispersed, so they're more similar to each other. Um, Combidex is one of these. AMI228, so these are all in clinical trials. And then there's next generation uh, sensors. And so these are all T2 star weighted. So this is myon combidex magnetic nanoparticles. These are what they look like. This is their 3 nanometer, so between 3 and 5 nanometer crystals. This is a schematic of what it looks like when it has the um, dextran coating it. And dextran is just a sugar. These crystals pack, which makes it super paramagnetic. Um, and then here's the blood concentration of the combidex in humans. So injecting different amounts of it and then looking at the time course. So this is the blood clearance of Combidex. And this is one of the clinical trials that, uh, that um, was done with these. So these particles are interesting. They're taken up by macrophages. And so in the lymphatics, there's a lot of macrophages in lymphatics. And in a normal lymph node, 
the whole bulk of the lymph node will be just all macrophages. So the combidex will, the myon nanoparticles will get out of the bloodstream. They will enter through the interstitium. So this is again these uh, two compartment models. So here's the bloodstream. They enter into the interstitium where they're taken up by macrophages. These macrophages will then transport them through the lymph and they'll reside in the, in the lymphocytes in the lymph node. If there's no cancer in this lymph node, all of this is uh, macrophages, and so on the T2 star weighted scan, the whole lymph node will go dark. However, if there's a tumor, tumors do not pick up the nanoparticles as well as the macrophages, so this will remain bright on the T2 star contrast because there's not as much of the iron oxide particle in the metastasis. And this way, you can look and accurately stage cancer for whether or not it's in the lymph node, and then you can do surgery and only take out the lymph nodes that are important. So here, for example, on the upper part, but because this is a T2 star weighted image, you have to do a pre and a post. So here's the pre-injection image. Um, so the, here's two lymph nodes, both of them, the red and the green. Uh, that's what they look like on this T2 star weighted scan, so you can't really tell the difference between them. But then 24 hours after injection, coming back and doing a scan in the same area, you can easily see that this lymph node has been completely taken. This lymph node, the macrophages in it, are, are homogeneously dispersed, and they've taken up all of the iron oxide nanoparticles, so there's no tumor there. However, this lymph node is almost all tumor. Only this little sliver has macrophages in it, and so this lymph node should be removed. Uh, based on, should be removed from surgery. So if you're really interested in this, this was a really great paper that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, and I recommend that you read it. It's, it's really a fantastic use of iron oxides in imaging. Um, again, here's some more data from this. So here's this uh, lymph node. This is a normal lymph node. It went all dark. Here's a lymph node that only partially went dark. And then the same thing with here, here's a lymph node, and there's still little parts of the tumor in there. So after removing them, you can do H&E, hematoxin, hematoxylin, and eosin staining, um, and look, and again, indeed, this is all normal uh, lymph node, this is all tumor, and then here's a subsection of this that showing that there is some normal, but some tumor also. So this illustrates, again, the power of this type of technique. So here's what we like to do with imaging. We really need to know the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Sensitivity is the number of um, true positives. Specificity is true negatives. And then accuracy is a combination of both. So there's actually equations for this. So sensitive, sensitivity is calculated by true positive over true negative plus false positive. So that is the percentage of, of times that it picked it up and that it was accurate. And the only way to know this is by having a gold standard, and the gold standard in most cases is histology. So removing all those lymph nodes and looking and seeing. So that's the sensitivity. Specificity is true negatives over true negatives plus false positives multiplied by 100%, and that tells you exactly the sensitivity and specificity. So in this MR, it's 100% with the iron oxide particles for sensitivity specificity, and it's 97.5% um, accurate. And uh, again, these all have to be compared to the gold standards. So in summary, we talked about the origin of the MRI signal. Uh, we talked about the properties of the magnetization and the image appearance. We talked about the gradients to spatially encode the signal. We talked about K-space and the use of Fourier transforms to produce the image. Pulse sequences T1 versus T2 weighted. And then finally, a little bit on the hardware and the contrast agents that are relevant for this course. So here are some of the acknowledgments, the basics of MRI, simply physics, magnetic resonance imaging, 
on the Beth Israel Deaconess Cardiac MRI website. And if you're really interested in this, talking to John Mugler, Chris Kramer, or Fred Epstein, um, and to Craig Meyer in the BME department would be really a great place to go. So now let's talk about and shift gears over to CT, which is commuted tomography. So we're going to talk about CT image and acquisition and all of the subjects listed here. So unlike MR, which is an inherent um, proton inside the body, this is x-ray. So this is 3D x-ray imaging. So here's a point-like x-ray source, and then from there it goes through the body and then it's detected. The traditional 2D x-ray imaging does not spatially encode, so it collapses all of the signal that you could get from this onto a single thing. So really that's just looking at bone. However, when you do CT, you can see soft tissue structures, organs, and bone. So problems with the 2D radiography, you get a superposition of structures. So you can't tell they're all on top of each other. Reduced contrast and thick sections, the x-rays will start to scatter, um, and you can't resolve 3D structures. And here's a difference between planar radiography and CT. So radiography has better spatial resolution. That's because you're using more of the signal. And I'll tell you why in a little bit, why we have to throw out some of the signal for CT. And it has everything to do with spatially encoding the signal. You can use a lower dose. It's less expensive. However, there's lower contrast and it superimposes structures. CT has a lower spatial resolution, so again, that's the difference in the size difference or the distance between, um, you can tell the difference between two structures. You have to use a higher dose and it's more expensive. However, it has higher contrast and you can really look at different uh, structures. So you can do that tomographic slicing. So again, this is projection versus slice. So this is a 2D um, radiography or an x-ray. You can see that the the lungs and the rib cage and the liver and the heart, they are all superimposed on each other. But here, doing the 3D, you can go through and look at one slice. So now you can get the right ventricle, the right atrium, the, the um, SVC. You can get some of the soft tissue structures like the liver, and over here is the stomach. Here's your uh, aorta, that's your saphenous vein, um, so on and so forth. So. Here's a lot of terms for CT. So the volume to be scanned, just like MRI, it's, it's divided into a matrix of 3D volume elements. Those are voxels. The planar x-ray projections are obtained to a wide range of angles, and a view is defined by the location of the x-ray source. For each view, each detector measures the total attenuation of all the voxels lying along the line between it and the source. These lines are rays, and the measured total attenuation is a ray sum. Attenuation is the amount of absorbance and scatter. So think of it as light. So as those rays are going through, if it's a dense tissue like bone, it's going to absorb it, and it could potentially scatter that. So, But if it's not a dense tissue, kind of like the lungs, it will go all the way through, so it will hit the detector. So attenuation is how much it, um, it, it started with versus how much hits the detector in general. So taken together, the set of ray sums for a particular view is called the attenuation profile, and you need this to build the 3D image. So here's, I'm not going over all of the different CT scanners, but here's a fourth generation. This X-ray detector will rotate inside the stationary detector ring, so on the outside, these yellow parts are the detector, and this green part is the x-ray source, and it will rotate um, in the direction of the arrow all the way around. This is what the parts look like inside, taken apart. So again, here's the detectors on the outside, and then there's the rotating uh, x-ray source. So here's one view. Here's the source. Um, these are the rays. The sum of all of this, these points along this ray is your ray sum. And then here is your detector. So this is one view. Here is the angle. 
and then this is the slice of that 360, and then there's the view, and this is computed as a profile. So that's the ray sum, or the attenuation. The profiles from all of the views are used to calculate the 3D image using a reconstruction algorithm. So in BME and engineering and physics, there's a lot of work done on these reconstruction algorithms. You want them to be as fast, but as accurate as possible. So after reconstruction, each voxel will contain a single number, its CT number, and this number is proportional to the attenuation in the corresponding part of the scanned volume. So 2D slices from the reconstructed volume or 3D rendered portions of it are viewed. So you can look at it as slices or you can put all of those 2D slices together to make up the 3D portion. So attenuation. And this is not for MR, but for a lot of other of the imaging modalities, attenuation will mean, will mean almost the same thing. It's the removal of the X-ray pho photons from the beam either by absorption or by scattering. And this has a linear attenuation coefficient mu. And it's, and it's intrinsic to the material, and it's a measure of the degree to which it attenuates X-rays. The linear attention coefficient of a material depends on the energy of the X-ray photons in the beam. So higher energy produces lower attenuation in general. So of course, the more energy you throw into the system, the better it can break through and go all the way to the detector. However, X-rays and other radiation can cause cancer or other disease, so you can't bombard living things with high amounts of, of radiation. So these, this next concept of collimation is exactly why you get less uh, resolution from, from a CT than you do from an X-ray or 2D. So collimation is how you set the beam's fan angle. And it's also how you encode the space, um, this, the 3D part of this. And so collimation, these are lead um, or other things that are designed uh, to keep the X-ray beam just in this really well-known angle. So that way you can accurately reconstruct it. So any of the X-rays that hit this will be destroyed and they won't be able to go back and, and hit through this tissue and hit the detector. So the collimation keeps the, keeps the angle of this, um, of this view at a very set prescribed angle so you can go back and do the reconstruction appropriately. So here's a side view. There's another collimator, a beam width collimator. So this sets the, the width of the beam before it set the angle. This is the beam width. And they uh, are used to limit the beam width and the z-dimension, and this determines the thickness of the slices in the reconstructed image. Um, and so again, if, you, if, you, if it's too thick, you don't get as much information, but if it's too thin, again, you won't get as much information as you want. You won't get enough signal in your voxel in order to be able to see it. So the 3D image reconstruction is from many 2D projections. So all along this, uh, ray, and these are the ray sums, so this is the mu1, so along this voxel of the ray, there's a certain attenuation coefficient, there's a mu2 attenuation coefficient, mu3, mu4, mu5, each of these for the different voxels along this ray, um, and then here is the additive, this is the ray sum with the mu um, coefficients. So image reconstruction, it's the process by which the 3D attenuation distribution is derived from the projections. In MRI, we saw that it was case space um, to Fourier transform. There's two general types of reconstruction algorithms in uh, CT. One is analytical and one is iterative. Um, I'm not going to really take you through those uh, algorithms. I can tell you, if you're really interested in this, um, Mark Williams is uh, an expert in this. He's a physicist um, in the School of Medicine who has built these scanners and works on the algorithms. But just like MR, we really need to talk about factors that affect the high contrast spatial resolution. One is detector size, one is the spot size, magnific magnification factor, the slice th thickness, and the slice pitch. So these are the resolution of these reconstruction algorithms. So if you have to throw out too many, too much of the signals, then um, you don't get as much 
um, contrast, um, the image matrix size, um, and then the total number of, of rays acquired. So really it's the total number of, of rays uh, acquired. And the factors affecting noise. So you want as high of signal as possible and as low of noise. So most noise in CT image is X-ray quantum noise. It's Poisson distributed. It's determined by the number of detected X-ray photons per voxel. So image noise is increased if either the total number of detected X-rays or the volume size is decreased. So less signal, you get more noise. So let's talk a little bit about radiation dose in CT, factors affecting dose. This is the target or the filter selection, um, the MAS selection, amount of slice overlap, um, and patient size. So annual dose limits, because this is radiation, uh, people are limited in their dose. So occupational, these are people who work with CT scanners, the CT technicians. Whole body is 50 MSVs. A lens, which is your eye, is 150, everything else is 500 in cumulative because radiation damage just doesn't go away. You don't repair that. It lasts forever. It's 10 times the amount of the age. However, for the public, that's if you and I were going to get a scan, the whole body is 5 to 1, infrequent to frequent, and lens, skin, and extremities are 50. So we are allowed a much, much smaller dose. Um, and it's really important to see the typical organ radiation doses from various radiologic studies. So here's your dental radiography. The relevant organ is the brain. Um, and so dentists are actually using less of the x-rays to do the dental radiography um, because of the exposure to the brain. Um, screening mammography, uh, adult abdominal CT. You can see that these CTs, neonatal CTs, carry a pretty high dose of uh, radiation. And so they're not just benign things. It, it's pretty safe, but it's not benign. There are contrast agents for x-ray CT. They're not used very often. Um, one is iodine, the other is gold, and the other is fluorine. So gold, we've seen with the magnetic nanoparticles, you can put iodine on different materials, uh, some of the nanoparticles, and conjugate iodine to the molecules, and then also fluorine. So instead of using F18, which I'll teach you for the PET, um, you can use the um, other forms of fluorine that's not radioactive, and it will be X-ray or CT visible. So here's iodine in the clinic. This is for an angiogram. Uh, so these are injected up into the blood vessels, and they're trying to determine a blockage. So here you can see that there's a blockage. And I really suggest you go to these YouTube videos and watch how this is done. It's thread through a catheter that goes up here, and then the iodine is injected. It reaches the whole arterial tree. And then you can see that this blood vessel has a certain uh, uh, diameter. Um, pre and post, but it's occluded here, so there's a blockage right there that has to be taken out. Um, CT is the current gold standard test in most uh, centers, especially for cancer. Here is a tumor in the head of the pancreas. This is the gallbladder, liver. You can see the kidneys. This is the uh, vertebrae, so your uh, backbone superior mesenteric um, artery, and here's the vein, and then this is the pancreas. This is a tumor in the head of the, uh, head of the pancreas. This is not contrast uh, imaging. This is just CT, relying on normal body. Um, and then here's iodine-based particles. And so these are the dendromeric particles. So they start out with PEG, and then here's the different dendromers, PEG core. Um, and then at the very end, they can put this group that has three iodines on them. And with that, here's the pre-contrast uh, pre agent imaging. And then here's two minutes, 10 minutes, 22 minutes, and 32 minutes still picking up the, the tumor here. So these are good uh, contrast agents. And then finally, gold-based nanoparticles. Um, and so this is the, the kidneys. Uh, in the mouse 60 minutes after IV injection. Um, and then you can see here, this is cancer imaging, and so this is looking at the blood vessels. So this is really looking at the blood vessels. They're not looking at anything else. It's not targeted to the tumor, but they're looking at the blood vessel tree that's flowing into the tumor. You can make a targeted contrast agent with gold, but it, 
you really have to have a lot of your target there. It's not the most sensitive thing for molecular imaging. I wouldn't advise it. So that's all um, that I have for today. And next lecture will be on, um, on CT and SPECT.